Welcome to the Seahawkers podcast with your host, Adam Emmert. He turns around to the Vikings bench and starts talking smack. I love it. And Brandon Schultz. I like the spin on that better. 2017 Seahawks. Everywhere else is awesome. Go Hawks. This is episode 167 of the Seahawkers podcast. I'm Brandon Schultz of the Military Seahawkers. And joining me, my good buddy and Montana Seahawker, Adam Emmert. Two weeks of the preseason in the book, Brandon. How you feeling? You feeling you feeling all right about this team? Because there was a gamut of emotions ran as a Seahawks fan, I think, uh, through week two of the preseason. Yeah, two weeks down, two weeks to go. And with the third game coming up, I think I speak for a lot of Seahawks fans. And uh, let's just get through this next game injury free so we can get in the season. I know uh, a lot of people were ready to pull our starters as soon as George Fant went down in this last <laughs> last game, because right. hey, when you see something like that, you start to think, yeah, I don't want any more of this. Right. Um, well, uh, I think that Fant injury will absolutely play a factor in how much the starters, especially in offense, end up playing uh, next game because you're going to be seeing a dress rehearsal for the possible fill in starters. So you're going to have to have the guys around them out there to see how those left tackles perform in their, in their basic tryout here. So could, they could be, in, they could end up playing more than makes more people comfortable. If you haven't realized already, we're going to be talking a lot of offensive line this show, but we're we're also going to be talking some other things, too, because we have Justin Britt, who signed a new contract. I want to talk about what that means for Jimmy Graham, because that was kind of an exercise that a lot of talk shows played in the offseason. Right. If you resign Cam, you resign Britt, uh, you know, who who's left out is Graham left out. We want to get into that. Uh, talk about Russell Wilson. After that game against the Vikings, it looks like he's poised for a big year. But then you have George Fant go go down. What does that mean for the offensive line? We'll get into that. And, uh, of course, we have uh, Do Better and Better at Life. And we want to talk a little bit about uh, our new quarterback that was signed in this last week, too. Going into the last show, we hinted Say at what? The, uh, the, the new corner. That the Seahawks oh, corner. Sign. I yeah. thought you said quarterback, and I was like, "What? We had a quarterback <laughs> sign? What? Why? I missed this." You, you know, you didn't miss that. Just the cornerback part. Okay. All right. So we will get into all that and more coming up in this show. Adam, why don't we start off with this game against the Vikings? Because again, a, a good showing by the first team offense this game. A good showing by the first team defense relatively, not allowing a touchdown to the Sam Bradford-led Vikings uh, early on. So that was nice to see, although they they did drive the field early. Uh, But my big takeaway from this game, Russell Wilson looks ready. Oh, man, he is locked in. That's my quarterback, man. Look, I mean, if you you've been looking or, or looking at Russell Wilson over the last couple of years, I mean, just look at him physically out there too. He does actually look trimmer. He looks more like kind of that rookie body type that he came in with, and you can tell he, this being his now what is it fifth season? Russell Wilson going into his sixth season this year. Yeah. The mastery is there. He understands everything about the offense now. I saw a graphic uh, that Pro Football Focus had put together regarding his uh, completion percentages when he was throwing the ball on two and a half seconds or less. And it was a pretty steady uh, hyperbolic curve going up here with his uh, completion percentage. And basically here in the preseason, he's rocking it, man. It's something like 64% of his... uh, I don't know the exact number, but it was something like that. Just really killing it with those quick decisions. And that's a guy that has now seen so much defense played against him that he can pick him apart before he gets up to the line of scrimmage, know exactly where he's going with the ball, and he's delivering on time with accuracy, man. I couldn't be more excited about what he's done so far. I know what you mean, though. Watching Russell Wilson in this last game makes me so excited for the season because not only did you have Doug Baldwin doing his no- talk about another guy who looks yes. like he's going to another level, Doug Baldwin and a big 37 yard catch in this game too. 
First and 10 from his own 25. The first offense stays in there. Russell with a play action pass. Down the middle, Baldwin with the catch across the 40, 45. Midfield across the field to the right sideline. Knocked out of bounds. Gets a good block from Curse on the far side. And Doug Baldwin is run out of bounds by Antoine Exon Jr. The safety starting in place of Sendejo tonight, but even he couldn't catch up with Baldwin. A 37-yard pickup and a first down. And the thing that's fun to watch about Baldwin is watching him create separation because he does it better than anybody on this team. And some of the moves that he was putting on some of the Vikings corners just to get open. I, I'm excited to see what he's going to do once the season starts, too. I'm surprised the Vikings defensive backfield coach didn't walk out on the field and just hand Terrence Newman his walker. Because (laughs) Doug Baldwin made him just look silly. And I understand Terrence Newman is ancient. He's like 39 playing corner out there. So, you know, bless his heart for being able to to still do that at that level. Like, that's pretty impressive. But, man, he just Baldwin just put on a clinic as to what it means to run routes. He really is so shifty and so quick and explosive out of his cuts. It really is incredible. And the chemistry that he and Russ have is, again, off the charts. So uh, you couldn't be more... Uh, encouraged by those signs here just in week two of the preseason. And you poo-pooed me for my 100-catch prediction for Baldwin, but I I think you're starting to see what I'm talking about here. Well, here's the problem. I also said that the running game would get really cranked up and we'd be running the ball a heck of a lot more, and we're not seeing that to date. No, we're not, but I will also say that the depth at running back is it's interesting to me. Now we, we didn't get to see Thomas Rawls because I guess he had a dinged up ankle. They wanted us, him. They wanted him to sit out just as a precautionary measure. Mm-hmm. And uh, Eddie Lacy, he gets the start. I gotta say, I'm not super excited about Lacy <laughs> after these first couple games. He could be fourth on the depth chart right now. I mean, I put Rawls, Procise, in probably Chris Carson ahead of him at this point. He looks like a plotter man out there. He looks so slow. And one thing about Chris Carson that was cool is that not only did he have some nice looking runs, he caused a fumble on the opening, the second half kickoff. Uh, It led to three points and some trash talk from Blair Walsh, which was kind of cool. Yeah. And uh, and then Mike Davis, you know, he had a touchdown as well uh, and a big 38 yard run. Second down and eight from the four yard line. Again, I backs Boykin again, hands it to Davis, who pops it outside left. The 10, 15, 20 down the far sideline, 30, the 40 cuts back in and is dropped at about the 43 yard line. On the far sideline, the Vikings were so intent, Warren, to keep everything inside that he just popped outside and took off to the races for a big gain of 38 yards. And as cool as that was to see, you know, him kind of bumping outside and getting around, especially with the team pinned back early in the second half. I think the cooler play to me was seeing Russell Wilson move up into the pocket and throw it out to the outside to Davis when playing up against the first teamers and seeing Davis ramble in for the touchdown. Third and four from the 22, five of seven on third down of the Seahawks. Quick flare pass left side, ball's caught. Davis down to the 15, down to the 10, he's going to go. Five, dives in, touchdown, Seahawks! Just a little swing pass out of the backfield, a 22-yard pickup. And Mike Davis packs it to the house. That was kind of a cool play, man. One of the things that uh, was neat about it was the idea that ordinarily back in the day, Russell Wilson would take off with that football, right? Yeah. And, he, and he'd run. I mean, great. Put it in the hands of a playmaker. Get yourself out of harm's way. You know, still get the seven points. I like it. I, I did, again, another thing that points to the maturation of our quarterback here. And that's one thing that I I feel like I'm seeing more from Russell Wilson in the preseason. Maybe it was just because it it was part of the drills that I was watching when I went to training camp uh, a couple weeks back is that it seems like there's more of an effort for Russell to hit that check down receiver. And like it was with Davis in that case, or I, I noticed it in the last game and then just watching them run drills specifically for hitting the check down at training camp. That's something I, I would like to see that a lot more from Russell. Yeah, it definitely seems like they're kind of concentrating on his in-pocket passing, you know, to a degree and just trying to keep that uh, tight. He's always been good at it. It's just a matter of if he's had time. And we saw what it was two seasons ago where they really adjusted to that quick passing game. And you see that that's kind of been an emphasis here so far uh, this preseason as well. 
And uh, with the loss of Fant in the performance of our other tackle in pass protection, we're definitely going to need to rely on the idea that Russell Wilson just gets the ball out of his hand uber quick. Well, let's talk about Fant because that was probably the most disappointing moment of the game. And it was starting to feel like Fant was really solidifying himself as a, a, a decent left tackle because we saw well, him. He was, he had a good, you know, quarter and a half of one game. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He was looking he, good. He, he looked good this game. Yes. Against real competition. And we found out in this week, right before the game against the Vikings, that the Seahawks had essentially made their decision with the left side of the line that it was going to be Fant and Jokel. So they had made a decision going into this game, and then this happens. Yeah, this is how you know God hates the Seahawks offensive line. He does, because finally, when they make a freaking decision, he's like, that was cute. Nope. <laughs> like, plucks a dude off of it. Yeah. And, and now, now, we're, now we're back at square one, seemingly. It was a real bummer. I'm going to say this straight up. I was very bummed out to see George Fant go down like that. That is not the way that I wanted to see him lose his job as the starting left tackle. I wanted him to bring in, you know, five or six guys and have one dude like just come out being the best. And then we didn't have to worry about playing a guy with no experience. Right. So the idea that we lost him to injury and in that way for a guy who's worked really hard and is seemingly a really good dude. It's just like Pete Carroll said, it's heartbreaking. Really brokenhearted about George Fan getting hurt. Um, just to, unfortunate. He's done so much, come so far, and everybody's cheering for him and rooting for him all along. And, and then he gets, he's going to be in trouble with, you know, getting back this season. He got an injury that's uh, going to require surgery, um, unfortunately. So, um, uh, so it's, it kind of takes a little something out of it for everybody. And you hear Pete Carroll there, and that's right after the game. In his post game press conference, he's Pete's down. He didn't. He yeah. he was he was upset about that. Yeah, he's upset about that. And I'd like to think it was all just because he's bummed out for George. But I think in the back of the his mind, he's going catfish. We put all our eggs in this basket of this left tackle to develop and to be there for the year. And we didn't really do anything to address the position. Otherwise throughout the off season. And now here we are, you know, basically with our pants around our ankles, you know? Yeah. I hope he does sound a little bummed out because this, this plan that they put in place through this off season, uh, like you mentioned it, Brandon, they brought in, or uh, they had the fewest number of dudes on offensive line competing in all of the training camps. If I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah, they had 12 guys on their team when everybody else, the, the NFL average was about 15. And most other teams had, I think there was maybe one or two other teams that had 13. But mo for the most part, it was at least 15 guys competing for offensive line jobs. But nope, that's not what we're going to do. We're just going to say, yeah, no, that guy's definitely going to get better after he played one season after the eighth grade. And uh, he definitely won't get hurt. Nobody else will get hurt and we'll be fine. We'll be fine. This, the, these guys that we're all just hoping on five to be able to come together, we d we definitely don't need six or seven because nobody ever goes down an injury in the NFL. So it, it's that's the frustrating part to me. Well, and the thing was is that Coach Carroll was so upset after the game that he couldn't even work in some some of his usual coach speak when talking about a player. Here he is talking about Riso Diambo. Um, he's been a little, little bit up and down. Um, he's been playing both spots, uh, guard and tackle on the left side. Uh, we, we like his physicality. He's, he's a good athlete. He's strong and tough and all of that. Uh, just, just cleaning up his game where he can be really consistent is what, is what we're, what we're concerned about. You know, how soon will that come? And will, will he be able to, uh, clean it all up in time to try to win one of these spots? So we'll see what happens. Not your usual hype from Pete Carroll. No, and understandably so. I mean, Odiambo did not look great in his stint out there at left tackle. I mean, he seems to be more suited for guard. I don't know. I, I Maybe he'll look better the next game. I mean, part of it is, too, that if you're not mentally prepared going into the game that you're going to be out there playing left tackle, like just to be thrust in there, especially after watching one of your buddies go down the way that he did, somebody that obviously everybody on the team seems to care for, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're going to struggle. Like you're just, it's just mentally, it's not going to click. So I'd look for Odiambo to have a better performance here in week three coming up. It's interesting to me that they, that they put Odiambo out there at left tackle. Now you've seen him playing in that spot a couple times in the preseason to this point in that first game. But it seemed to me like the plan was that 
Jokel could move out to left tackle and the Odiambo was the guy that you would have in there as guard. Yet we did not see that against the Vikings. Well, yeah, because that would follow facts, logic, and reason to take a guy who is like drafted as a tackle, has started as a tackle, and put him out there as a tackle. No, 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 no. Let's keep him at guard and uh, put somebody else out there who's never really started in this league at left tackle. Let's do that. Uh, What could go wrong? It's a great plan. I, I wonder about the idea of how the team feels about Luke Jokel because they seem almost set at to having him at the guard position. Do you think that the team would see Jokel as a potential, I, I don't know, pro bowl guard, but average at left tackle. So would you want to have a dude that you, you feel as a pro bowl left guard and a guy who is passable at left tackle, or do you want to have, if you flip flopped it and had Odiambo in as a passable guard, and Jokel was a passable left tackle. Would you prefer that option, or do you want to have somebody you know you can count on? Here's the thing, Brandon. We were counting on the idea that George Fant would be a passable left tackle, and we're still not sure that that was going to happen. And then after behind him, who do you have that you're looking at that could be a passable left tackle? There's only one guy, and that's Jokel. So I would definitely move him out to the outside and have one of the litany of mediocre guards we have on the roster come in and play mediocre guard next to Jokel and at least have okay across the board on left side rather than have, say, Jokel be a top 10 left guard and have a dumpster fire at left tackle because there's nobody there's nobody in the mix so far that we've had except for maybe one of these two new dudes that we're looking at that said, yeah, they can they can play passable left tackle. So, like, I, I just don't see that there's that option there. Well, this goes into the question from our buddy John Davison, who sent in an email, says, Hi, fellas. Well, we won, but it certainly doesn't feel like it. 20 to 13 was totally irrelevant after we lost Fant. I am genuinely gutted for him and find it hard to swallow. I know we have to move on, but I can't think we will be better with him out. This, in my opinion, is a huge setback for us. What do you think? Go Hawks from John. And I want to address this because going into the season and going into even the preseason a couple weeks ago, if you would have told me that George Fant, if he went down, it was or if he was not in the mix to start, would it feel like uh, bad news? But seeing him go down, it was it was gut wrenching. But at the same time, if if George Fant loses his job or another guy starts ahead of him, I mean, we've heard Pete Carroll say over and over again that, yeah, it's a good thing we have Luke Jokel on the team who can play both left guard and left tackle. I was not going into the season counting on the fact that Fant was going to start at left tackle. So for me now to to have that feeling inside that it's a huge setback, it's that, that I don't feel that way. No, I, I definitely don't feel that way. This doesn't feel insurmountable. Yeah. In any way. I mean, there there are options out there. There's still there's still guys. I mean, Brandon Albert's still out there. I mean, there's still guys that actually played that you could maybe, you know, coerce into bringing in. I mean, we went down the list a little bit earlier today, Brandon, just you and I off air about some of the veterans that are still out there. And you're like, yeah, snatched up, snatched up, snatched up, retired, retired, retired. And I kept finding myself asking, are they really retired? Like Jake Long, you really retired? Like really, really yeah. retired? King Dunlap, is he really retired? Really, really retired? A couple other guys that are still out there. Uh, Will Beatty for the Giants, uh, or who used to play for the Giants. Right. Uh, Mike Adams, who played for the Bears, right tackle. Uh, Michael Orr, a guy who has had concussion issues. So we, who knows what, uh, what he's looking at, but. Right. But a talented guy. I'd take Michael Orr. Yeah. I, uh, he's probably better than many of the other. uh, Well, look who we just signed after Fant went down. Tyrus right. Thompson, who's been with four or five different teams, good run blocker, but I, I don't think he's anything stellar as a pass blocker. Right. And then the the dude from the Jets. Yeah, Tobin. Yeah. From all accounts, I mean, is a little meh. But at least he's played. He's played in game. Tyrus Thomas hasn't played a dang game. Yeah, Tobin and Tobin could be one of the and I uh, just seeing what Eagles fans were saying online. Yeah, it seemed like. Uh, OK was about as positive as anything had to say about him. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, for when you're trading a fifth round draft pick for a guy like they did for Tobin, you see a lot of Seahawks fans and go, oh, the guy's OK. That means he yeah. can start. 
Right. And look, and he might be a little better than OK, because we're talking about Philly fans uh, assessment here. And these are the guys that throw batteries at Santa. Yeah, they're know? generally not positive people. No, they're they're nasty people. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, Tobin should be interesting to watch out there. Uh, he's going to have to fit into Tom Cable's system. Uh, we'll see how that kind of transition goes. But at least they brought in a couple guys. See, I just, you know, bring in these types of guys at the beginning of training camp. Not when it's an emergency. Yeah. Right. That was always my whole point. Yeah. Matt Tobin. That's his first name. Right. Well, Matt's not the most rememberable name, so. <laughs> Which is a word. Don't look it up. Rememberable. Rememberable. Not memorable. Rememberable. Rememberable. Yes. Well, let's talk about something positive because we've talked O-line now for a little bit. And I, I think we will get back into it as we talk about the, the Kansas City game coming up. But I want to okay. talk about a few guys that really jumped off the screen. And again, in back to back weeks, our buddy Casey Williams, who got a Wait, touchdown. No, no, you got the name wrong. It, no, I think I think I got it right. No, well, maybe this, but but the name's Karen. <laughs> you've 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 canonized this forever. I I'm not the only one to make this mistake, by the way. <laughs> oh, okay. Now now you're throwing other people under the bus to try to cover for yourself. I got you. I, I, I am throwing other people on the bus. I think I tweeted out about four or five different tweets from uh, from prominent dudes. I think like NFL Network Elliot Harrison. I think he had Karen Williams down. Uh, there were a couple other verified checkmark guys that had uh, Karen Williams in their Twitter timeline after after this play in particular, Adam. Russell takes the shotgun snap. He looks to Cason Williams, throws it up. Cason Williams reaches up. He makes a catch. It is a touchdown. Seahawks. The man who broke it up last play, Sherrills, gives up the six. But hey, give it to Cason Williams. This guy is a highlight reel in the first two weeks of the preseason. And this highlight was sandwiched in between a one-handed catch that he caught over the top of Xavier Rhodes. And then on the on the kickoff right after the touchdown, and he flew in there and, and made an out, outstanding tackle. Oh, yeah. He looked uh, like Ricardo Lockett a little bit in that situation. Yeah. You know, from back in the day. I I think he absolutely has solidified a spot on this roster. He's making the I team. mean, I'm, I'm getting yeah. a Karen jersey now. Yes. Yes. Well, I think uh, some of us there on the uh, Ring of Honor, I think DCH is uh, putting together a little fundraiser. I think we're going to we're going to try to get you one. He, yeah, that's uh, he made that pretty clear. DCH yeah. is uh, is getting me a Karen number 18 jersey. Yes. And uh, I after after one autocorrect and uh, now I'm I'm branded for life. <laughs> yes, you are. So don't screw up. You need to be perfect all the time. <laughs> that's a message to you, kids. Don't screw up. Exactly. The president can put out something like Kofefi, but you're not getting away with a Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I bet somebody's gotten uh, the president uh, a Kofefi jersey. Oh, maybe. Hard telling not know it, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, Karen Williams. Tell you what. he's make, Like you said, he's making this team. He's making this team, and just because he is versatile with the special teams as well. That, doesn't it feel like after watching him in the preseason, if curse went down or just somebody went down that you'd feel comfortable putting case and Williams out there. Well, like case even showed uh, just in this game, yeah, you know, they ran the same exact play to two different guys. You know, that little fade route to the end zone on right. the right side, Jermaine curse, not able to come up with the ball. I think he got wow. interfered with uh, more than, but uh, case well, yeah, and and threw it short. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, that's not he did he didn't throw the ball. No, no, no. It wasn't Curse's fault. No, Curse had a nice catch in this game. I, I think Curse is making the this this team too. There's a lot of people yeah. out there who seem to want to write off Jermaine Curse, but on Baldwin's long catch, Curse laid a nice block. Big block. Yeah. And and then he had that 18 yard catch over the middle, took a shot. And Curse is a guy that you can count on to be healthy week to week, unlike a guy like Paul Richardson, unlike a guy like Amaro Darbo, who was in there for one play and uh, and gets hit. Now, it was a pretty hard hit, but it took him out of the game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that Curse is a guy that you can count on. Right. Availability is the best ability. Yeah. And I mean, Curse has that. Well, maybe not the best, but it's it helps keep you in the in the on the team. It's it, it's one of the most important things. I mean, you can be the most talented dude in the world, and if you can't play, then what are you worth? So really cool to to see Case and Williams have a big game. Uh I thought Chris Carson made a nice showing for himself once again. Yeah. Nothing spectacular, but but looked pretty good. But 
Let me ask you. Let me ask you between Chris Carson and Mike Davis, which one of those guys is going to take the job from Alex Collins? Chris Carson. You think it's going to be Carson? He he looks like he has an NFL body. I think Davis looks pretty good too, though. He looks okay. He's also Davis is piling all that up against like the threes. Whereas Chris Carson has gotten some run against uh, at least a second team. Yeah, he showed he showed Davis on that touchdown run though. He showed a little bit of wiggle. Yeah. I mean, he looks like a dude. Yeah. Yeah. Chris Carson looks he's like get he's just up, a, though. He's not a guy that you can expect. Oh, that's yeah. just going to be, you know, no, you're not stashing him on practice squad yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. He's going somewhore. He'll, he'll, he'll be on an NFL roster. No doubt. And that's cool when you have that kind of depth, but it does. It makes it tough when I take Mike Davis over, over Eddie Lacy so far. I, I kind of would, too. <laughs> that's I mean, just, and that's why, you know, I I'm willing to accept in this offseason your premise that yes, that money that the team spent on Lacey right now, right now, after what I've seen after two right. preseason games, I'm thinking, yeah, they should have spent that money on offensive line. So it's looking like that would have been a smarter decision at this point, at right? The, at this point. But but the season is young, so I'm not going to hold you to that. Like, let's let's evaluate this at the end oh, of the year. Yeah, well, through yeah. the, yeah, this will be something that we talk about throughout the year, just like, you know, if Malik McDowell, it, with him not being expected to play, we're going to look at dudes like Cam Robinson uh, in Jacksonville. We'll look at Ryan Ramchick in, in New Orleans and see what those guys are doing as, as offensive linemen we could have used with the first pick. Correct. But we also know that Forrest Lamp is done with a knee too. So, right. I mean, could have ended up with that as well. So, I mean, I guess there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees. But, exactly. No. But it's still, but I would have, I would have been able to predict a down Eddie Lacy year a lot easier than whether or not any of those offensive linemen would be any good. You know what I mean? Like the, the writing's just on the wall for him, for, for Eddie Lacy. And I mean, I've made the arguments like forever ago, so I'm not going to do it all again. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm still it. willing and, and open to the idea that with Eddie Lacy coming off of his injury, that once the season starts, just like, you know, a lot like when Boykin isn't really showing up in practice, come game time, when it really matters, he's ready to show it. Maybe Eddie Lacy, once it, once it's week one against the Packers, uh, that's that's when it, he's going to turn on the Jets the, or, the, you, you know, and relatively. Then you and I watched a very different running back with the Packers. I just, I just never saw him as that guy yeah. ever, ever. I never feared Eddie Lacy. I never thought of him as an above average back. He just looked like a dude that plods around and smashes into people. Yeah, well, you said that about David Johnson for a while too. So I'm, I'm not willing to accept your, uh, your, your running back scouting ability. Oh, really? Yeah. I said Dalvin Cook would be pretty damn good. He looked all right, didn't yeah, he? he? He did look all right. He's probably going to mm, be the starter for the. Yeah. Wait till Samaji P. Uh, P. Ryan ends up being the starting back for the Redskins, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, we'll see about that. Yeah. See, all kinds of what ifs to watch out throughout the season. But exactly. One of those what ifs going into this season was Blair Walsh. And we saw in this yes. game, Blair Walsh, holy smokes, three kicks of over 50 yards in this game. He makes two. The third one wasn't as though he you know, whiffed it. He hits it on the crossbar almost entirely right in the center of the crossbar. So if he would have just had just a little bit more leg from 50 plus yards out, he would have been three for three and hasn't missed an extra point since he started. I'm excited to be wrong about Blair Walsh. So this is the story that I am most excited about coming away from this game. I loved watching Blair Walsh go out there and start booming. I mean, like you said, that 52 yarder that he missed, he just didn't catch it real clean. Yeah. But those other two 50 plus yard ones, I mean, they, they cleared like it was nobody's business. He didn't catch that very clean, that 52 yarder and damn near still made it. And then when he starts when he starts drilling them, he turns around to the Vikings bench and starts talking smack. I love it. That's how you know the dude's head is back in the right space. Yeah. Like you wouldn't if you felt like you were just kind of barely eking him in and all that stuff, you wouldn't turn to your old bench and like, you know, point fingers and stare down the coach and things like that. No. He's drilling him. He's hitting him dead center. He's had good week uh weeks leading up to this in camp. He's back, man. Blair Walsh has it figured out. This is going to be a good signing for us. Uh, the reclamation project that is Blair Walsh. The the pointing at the sidelines 
that that's what won me over with Blair Walsh. I was on the fence as to whether or not I would be a Blair Walsh fan. But when he starts talking junk to his opposing team, you count me in. I, I'm on the on the Blair Walsh fan train. Yeah, man. I, I think I just that finger point really to me pointed to the idea that his head is definitely back in the right mind space. Like his confidence is there. You just don't do that. If, if it, if you don't have it inside of you, if you haven't put those demons to bed and he's definitely done it. So congratulations to Blair Walsh so far. That's been, that was cool to see. Well, the other cool things I was uh, looking at watching the rookies in this game and, you know, Tedrick Thompson, he had the uh, interception in the fourth quarter, got tipped up in the air. That was cool to see. Uh, We saw a a pretty nice hit from Delano Hill in this game Mm -hmm. as well. Uh, And we also saw Nazare Jones with a sack on Case Keenum in the third quarter. Ham stays in at the single setback. Keenum out of the shotgun, takes a snap, steps up, in trouble, gets hit, goes down at the 15-yard line. Seattle bringing the tough rush, and Nazair Jones gets there. That young rookie has been a hit. He is going to be a player, and he is going to see a lot of action this year. And Rabel's got it right. Nas Jones is going to be a player that I think we're going to be talking about this year because... And, and this is the interesting thing to me. This is a guy who was only picked 12 spots behind Shaq Griffin. We've talked a lot about Shaq Griffin. We've talked a lot about Malik McDowell. But Nas Jones, just a couple picks back, it, it seems like he's he's kind of been the quiet one that people have uh, been kind of hesitant to talk about. But he's seeming like the real deal on the defensive line. So let's put a pin in Shaq Griffin real quick and come back to him later. Come back to him. But Nas Jones absolutely has totally flashed throughout this preseason. And um, just the opposite of the way that the Seahawks uh, have the ability to evaluate talent on the offensive line, the way they evaluate talent on the defensive line is really off the charts. They really do just hit it with these guys. I mean, they, they at least come in and are able to play for a couple seasons. They're not washouts right away. Or they become, you know, relative impact players, whether that's through free agency or the draft. They do a good job on the defensive line. And between Nas Jones and Quentin Jefferson, I think I feel pretty good about some of the backup options that we have on the defensive line going into this season. It's going to be a deep group. Now, the pass rush has not flashed at all in the preseason, and that's probably my biggest concern yeah. uh, overall coming out of the the preseason thus far. But then again, you're not running stunts. You're not scheming anything up. So I'm not going to wring my hands over that. But I think Nas Jones is going to be a big contributor in that way. He seems to be able to get after the quarterback more than he seemed to in college. He's just one of the guys that I'm, I didn't really expect to be excited about. Right. But I'm really excited about. Yeah, he, he was a guy that they talked about as having kind of a an effort issue in college. And I think he came to the right situation. Sure. And, and in a situation, too, when you have the the team's first pick, like Malik McDowell, go down, and now J- Jones has the opportunity to step in and, and play maybe a part of that role. I mean, it's looking like a home run so far. I mean, so good job. You know, tip of the hat to John Schneider. I mean, again, only two preseason games, but uh, definitely something to be excited about, no doubt about it. So what about the other third round pick, Shaq Griffin? Because we saw Jeremy Lane out there this this game playing the slot. Uh, Shaq Griffin, the the side opposite Richard Sherman. The Vikings went after Griffin a lot. And Carroll said in his postgame press conference or even on the Monday press conference that he was excited to see the response from Griffin and how he based on what Carroll said, you know, the the way that Griffin responded after the, the Vikings were clearly targeting him. That he resp- he felt like he responded pretty well to it. Yeah, I mean, he didn't fall apart mentally or anything like that. It's clear that Shaq Griffin has a long way to go to being a starting corner in the NFL because he's got half of the game down. He can you're not going to really beat him over the top. He's pretty good at that. We saw his highlight plays from the game were when they tried to throw deep on him, and he was able to take care of that. Now, where he really needs to put in the work is with the underneath stuff and slants and curls and things like that. That's where he's getting turned around a lot. Um, his his footwork is not efficient, and he's just getting chewed up underneath. And, I mean, you saw Stephon Diggs. I mean, that was 
stealing candy from a baby yeah. throughout that first quarter. I mean, that's with Sam Bradford, a quarterback, too. So let that wash over you. I really hope that uh, Brock from the Niners is going to be a, a guy that can come in and play serviceable corner until Deshaun Shedd comes in, because I just think that uh, Shaquille Griffin just has a long ways to go. He's just got a lot of technique to learn. He's just raw, but all the tools are there. I think someday he'll get there, but just just not now. Yeah, Tremaine Brock brought in, uh, signed by the Seahawks before, uh, or, you know, later in the week, last week. And there are a lot of concerns about Brock, you know, being accused of assault, you know, domestic violence in this offseason. And apparently from, from what Coach Carroll said is that they did a lot of vetting to make sure that this, this is something that they, that they could bring him in comfortably, given the team's position in the past of not bringing in anyone who has hit a woman. Well, when they drafted Frank Clark, right, we both kind of stood on the table and said, all right, you're gambling with our trust here, and we're going to have to trust you, Pete and John, uh, that you do do your homework and you're not bringing in a a cancer and a guy that's, um, you know, does the wrong thing, right? And uh, it seems like that they have come through with that draft pick. I mean, as far as Frank Clark is concerned and his off the field issues, they haven't been there. He's been a model citizen. So relatively. Yeah. Besides from little hiccups here and there with, uh, you know, on Twitter and that sort of thing. But you're talking about, you know, actual criminal stuff. Yeah. Actually doing bad things. Right. Oh, oh, no. He said something bad on Twitter. Well, oh, oh, my stars. <laughs> I hope we all can get over it. Um, so I'm going to trust they're they're building trust in this area with me. I mean, John and Pete are. So I'm going to trust them on this as well. I feel like I'm starting to notice a trend here with uh, with defenses to certain, I don't know, criminal activities, because what you mm-hmm. had your your do better for the Cowboys a few weeks back of the, the dude with the cowboy. What it was lucky whitehead. Yeah, that uh, was charged with a crime. And he said, oh, well, I wasn't even in that state. And now we're hearing the same thing from Tremaine Brock. It, it just seems awfully coincidental that this is now the, the like the go to defense is that, oh, I wasn't even there. Well, I mean, if you're not, what else are you supposed to say? I, I, I understand. I I just I'm, I'm going to be watching this going forward, Adam, to see if this continues to be a defense that NFL players use the, the whole I wasn't even, you know, in the vicinity defense. I, all I know is I'm using it in my everyday life from now on. Okay. Like, you didn't do the dishes. I wasn't even there. <laughs> wasn't even there. Yeah, I can't blame me. I wasn't even there. Yeah. Wasn't even in the same state. No, we'll tell your uh, HOA that uh, because your your lawn is golden, that uh, it's because you weren't even there. I wasn't even there. I couldn't. I couldn't do anything about it. I can't water exactly. the yard. I wasn't even there. Yeah. Jeez. This is great. Great defense. It's a great defense. All right, Adam. Well, uh, another big news item from this last week. Justin Britt, our center, signed to a long term deal, a three year extension worth twenty seven million dollars. This is exciting. The the Brit progression is now the, the Brit equation and one that equals twenty seven million dollars. Yeah. The, yeah. The Brit payday. Yeah. That's what happened. And good for him, man. I mean, he really finally came together for him. And good for the team on this. Look, they finally invested in an offensive lineman that you brought up and had succeed, and you got him signed under contract before he hit the open market. That hasn't happened. I mean, whether that's Carpenter or Sweezy, I mean, a lot of these guys we bring up, they've become competent, and then we just let them walk. Finally. Yeah. They signed a guy. You could have knocked me over with a feather when I saw that come across my screen. They care. I was stunned. They care about the offensive line. <laughs> they- 27 million catfish given right there. Uh, on hawkblogger.com, Evan posted the contract details. If these are, in fact, the numbers in the Justin Brick contract, they got a heck of a deal because, you know, his base salary for this year, it, it stays the same. Uh, he gets the the five million dollar bonus or five million guarantees. It's, I guess it's ten million dollars in prorated bonuses. But his base salary for next year, two point seven million base salary for 2019, four point five million. It isn't until 2020 that his base salary jumps to eight point two million. And by 2020, that's going to seem like nothing for a, 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 a competent center. It's it's nothing right now. Look at how these guys got paid all these offensive linemen throughout this offseason. They got to steal. I know. They got to steal. I didn't think you were going to get him for less than five or six million a year. 
No, they, they got a heck of a deal. And well, I guess five or six million per year is is maybe what it averages out to. It, but uh, right. But I mean, you're saying those first few years are less than that. Oh, I know. Yeah. Just the overall average, though. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It, the average in base salary is only four million dollars over the ne- starting this year and over the next four years. Right. Yeah. And that's including that last year, the deal that you won't you never see. Yeah, right. That's a really you never good see deal. that last year. So that's a that's a hell of a deal. Right. No, I'm happy for Justin Britt. Yeah, me too. Um, some stability there. I think that that works out great. Here's hoping that uh, Jokel works out great at left guard. That's somebody that we can eventually extend. That'd be that'd be awesome to have. You know, at least two guys that you feel solid about. Because that seems to be about the only two guys that uh, Cable feels solid about so far. Yeah, Glowinski had a solid game this last game. I thought. Yeah, yeah. So maybe he can uh, grow into one of those st- starting jobs. He sh- he showed the promise in the past, and that's where he played in college. So maybe he's that next guy that you look at and you go, oh, there's that season we've been looking for out of yeah, him. Yeah. But I, I don't feel confident that's going to be Jermaine Effetti anytime soon. That dude can't pass protect for the life of him. He's a hell of a run blocker, but he can't pass protect worth a gosh darn dude. I, I it was fe- bad. I felt that way about Odiambo in this game, too. It seemed like oh, all I the run plays, they were... They were fine, and and it was the pass plays that that, that was there was the struggles, big time the struggles. But uh, so if Eddie uh, though, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> that's about the best way I can put it. How I, do we have an entire team full of guards? I feel like it's just an entire offensive line of of dudes that play guard well. Right. Where do you think did Tom did Tom Cable play guard? He must have. <laughs> that, that has to be the only answer, right? Because Tom Cable is sitting in the back office going, I just want dudes who are guards. Right. I don't want those hoity toity left tackles, those prima donnas. Don't want any of those. Just give me a bunch of guards. Yeah. Yeah. A bunch of rough and tumble guards. Exactly. And maybe that it, because it, being a run first team, that's what they want. Yeah, that's fine. If you're actually going to, you know, be a run first team, it's looking like the passing game is far more effective than the running game here in the preseason so far. That's true. But a big part of that is Russell Wilson. Well, yeah. So thank goodness <laughs> for him. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> we just need to protect him. And fortunately, yeah, we just don't. At least we don't play in Dominican Sue the first week of the season. So he doesn't have to get stepped on again. Right. Hey, look, if they if, if Jokel, uh Britt and whoever they decide on at right guard, whether that's Ibushi or Glowinski, then if if they can play solid, right? Those three dudes right in the middle, even if you're getting beat around the outside, you know, as long as the, the tackle pushes him, you know, to the outside rather than getting beat right. back inside. They give enough room in the pocket, right? Right. Then if if the those three guys in the interior can keep, you know, the line of scrimmage there and not get a big push right up the middle, mm-hmm. that gives Russell Wilson somewhere to step up into and then spin out and create and do all those things. I mean, we can still we can still survive that way. It's not going to be the ideal way. It's not the way that you want this to work, but Russell Wilson can make that work. Yeah. Well, I so want go- I think that Brit signing is big for that going forward. And the other thing going forward that kind of surprises me now is we've had that discussion about Justin Britt and Cam Chancellor and Jimmy Graham. And can you keep all three? Because back in February, when we were talking about this, it's, it didn't it didn't even seem like a possibility. Mm-hmm. But we have Jedi Master John Schneider able to to work these contracts like nobody else. And now it feels like you could. Actually, keep Jimmy Graham on this roster too. Keep all three. Yeah, we we said after the Cam signing, we looked at that contract and we're like, man, that's that's fairly team friendly. I I like that contract. Yeah. And then this Brit one, we just had that same discussion. Man, that's fairly team friendly. Well, if you got two of those, that gives you a pretty good sense that y- you know you could have the room to re-sign Graham. And if he can do his voodoo magic on Jimmy Graham too, then you know you might get another team friendly deal out of him as well. Even if you can't. The, the thing about Jimmy Graham's contract and the way tight end salaries are going, if it came down to it and you needed to use your franchise tag, you could use your franchise tag on Jimmy Graham. That's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. Because his salary isn't going up all that. Just what? 20 percent over what it is currently is how the franchise deal tag works right now. Yeah, depending. Yeah, exactly. 
That's that's not uh, for a, for a top tier tight end. You're doing all right. You're still doing just fine. So, yeah, they've done a really good job with all of that. So we'll see. We'll see how that all plays out when it's all said and done. We know for sure they they uh, probably won't sign another offensive lineman to a big deal. We know that. <laughs> I don't know, man. You just said Jokel. Maybe maybe he they extend him. Yeah, if he plays well, that'd be cool. And he's been playing pretty well. Apart from, I think, maybe a penalty or two in this game, he didn't jump out at me as being terrible, which is positive. So he played pretty good. Yeah. (laughs) That's pretty good by offensive uh, uh, Seahawks offensive line. But I spent most of my time watching Odiambo, and when he would whiff on his first block, he would then then he would get flustered and he'd even miss when he had another chance to to block the dude again after the you know whether it was Russell or Boykin you know moving away and scrambling I would see him with a second time ah, I'm like dude yeah it wasn't a good showing <laughs> let's uh, let's hope that uh, that cleans up a little bit here like I said maybe just not being prepared to com- come in and play tackle I'm gonna be know? optimistic yeah I, I'm not gonna crush him anymore and that let, let's talk about this game gum- coming up against Kansas City because okay. That has to be the number one thing that we're watching, right? Offensive line. How does it mm-hmm. play out? And there was even the media asking Coach Carroll about what's next at this left tackle position. Well, you're going to wait and see, okay? I'm not going to tell you about that right now. We're going to, Right now, uh, you, you saw what happened. Um, you know, Reese goes right in there and starts playing. And so that's the first thing that happens. And then we'll, you'll see what happens after. Carol doesn't even want to give it away. He wants us to wait and see. Oh, my God. You know what that sounds just like? That sounds like a presidential candidate out on the campaign trail, and they ask him or her about a policy, and they're like, oh, I'm not going to let you know about that just right yet, but trust me, it's going to be awesome. We have like, a plan. We have a, we plan, have a plan, but we're not and telling you about it yet. it yet, but we'll put it up on our website. Rah, rah. Yeah, <laughs> same crap. And they have no plan. Right. I don't think they have a plan. But uh, it sounds like uh, in the plan that they don't yet have, that Posick might even be a part of that plan. Could be. Yeah, he has played left tackle in his past. He's done everything. So he's already played just a little bit of everything for us. Um, that, that's a possibility. He's only played a short time there at the left side. He's been primarily a right side guy. But when you're a center, then you have to be somewhat ambidextrous. And, and uh, so um, that's a possibility also. So with the way he's kind of being coy about this, and it doesn't seem like he's super excited about Odiombo based on the last mm. week performance. Who who do you think we're going to see stepping in there at left tackle? Well, I don't think it's going to be Posick. I mean, I see Greg Bell from uh, the Seattle Times basically saying that uh, Tom Cable came out and said that Posick is not part of the left tackle plan. Okay. So I, I would say I'd say no on that. But uh, yeah, I mean, you're going to see Odiombo and Tobin. And uh, you may even see Jokel out there a little bit just to see, just get a look. Just to see, yeah. I mean, you're grasping at straws now, so that's what you're going to have to do. I don't see how this is that difficult when we were talking about going just, like I said, Fant going down doesn't seem catastrophic to me. So why should this be that like concerning? It's not. We're going to go through those guys and we're going to see which one plays the best and we're going to roll with it for a while. Sure. And it'll be okay. It's something that we can't overcome. Nobody's going to be worse than Fant was last year. That's what I feel like. I, yes. I, I feel like even Odiambo, with what we saw in this last game, is still equal to what Fant was last year. Right. And I think that's Odiambo on his worst day. We'll be watching offensive line going into this game. Yes. This is uh, the dress rehearsal game, as everybody calls it. Yeah, that's the theory, right? So uh, I really want to look at uh, pass rush, man. That is definitely number one on my list. I want to see if uh, Chris Richard tries to crank it up a little bit, get after Alex Smith, uh, and, and see just if they can generate a little a little pressure because that, that really hasn't come to light so far. Has Cliff Averill been out on the field at all? Oh, yeah. Okay. I haven't seen that's him. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, he's been, That's my point. But he's see, been out there, though. Usually when I'm looking at the first team defense... I'm noticing how much of Michael Bennett's arms that I can see because his shoulder pads are so small and that, uh, and that just is what jumps out at me. Well, no wonder you don't notice Cliff Averill then. Yeah. I'm just mesmerized by Michael Bennett. There's a lot of shoulders and guns out there for, for Mike B. No doubt. Need to see him getting after the quarterback too. I agree. The, that position, uh, what we're going to see at cornerback. I, one thing I am curious about now, you said that you thought Chad Griffin had a ways to go. But we've seen from Coach Carroll in the past a willingness to kind of project guys into Mm -hmm. 
mid-season form and willing to live with some of the growing pains kind of throughout the beginning of the season, knowing that they can grow from those. Look at George Fant just with last year. Right. And that was even, you know, toward the middle of the season where they project a guy to be a player of their future, a player of their core. And they'll go ahead and, and allow a guy to go out there and maybe make a few mistakes here and there. And and like you said, with Shaq Griffin, he wasn't getting beat deep. And the way the defense operates, that's what they like to see. So as long as he's not getting beat deep, maybe they'll be willing to to keep him out there and keep him in that spot opposite Richard Sherman to allow him to grow and develop into the type of player they, they expect him to be come midseason. Maybe. I think that the Seahawks do have some concerns inter- internally. Otherwise, you wouldn't have seen Tremaine Brock brought in. Yeah, I think that I think that's definitely pointing to the idea that. All right, well, maybe, but uh, let's bring in a veteran just in case, in case of emergency break glass. Yeah, and we've seen it with guys in the past too, to where come the cut downs to fifty three man, they say goodbye to some of those guys. You know, the veteran yeah. guys. Yeah, that could happen as well, but I guess we'll see. So I think that's definitely something of note to to watch through this uh, dress rehearsal, right? Um, the other thing to me is uh, the running game. I really want to see either Thomas Rawls or Eddie Lacy really crank it up, yeah, and or, or even CJ Procise. So where where the hell is CJ Procise? You know, strap it up. Let's go. Yeah. I'm like, ready to I'm, see some pro size. I'm tired. I'm tired of the injuries, man. Like he's dealing with some groin thing or something right now. Yeah. Like golly, man. Yeah. The injuries on the, at the running back position are frustrating and, and that's where the depth comes in. But at some point you're going to have to make a decision. You can't keep six guys, right? I mean, you could, but you're. <laughs> yeah, I guess I'm less concerned as to who's doing the running of the ball. I just want to see. A bunch of, uh, you know, let's say the starting offense stays out there through middle of the third quarter, right? Yeah. I want to see a bunch of drives and situations where we end up in third and four, third and two, you know, anything third and five and less, right? I want to see a bunch of those where we went run, run, and now we're under third and f- third and five. And you have that flexibility to either run again or put in Russell, Russell Wilson's hands. So uh, that's, to me, that is the biggest thing. That is the biggest thing secondary to that would be the pass rush. And um, the third thing is to see if Earl Thomas wants to get beat again over the top. (laughs) He gave up a long one of this game out in zone coverage. He totally lost track of his dude. Yeah. One thing that I did like, though, Earl Thomas can still hit dudes. Yeah. Give give some digs. uh, Give digs a lot of credit, man. He took a he took a thump, man. He did and got up and, and, you know, did his little first down uh, move there. Yeah, as as though he wasn't phased, although I, I'm pretty sure, you know, that, that had to have phased him. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Cleared out some cobwebs. There's no doubt about it. Well, I have a couple things that I'm looking for in, in this game against the Chiefs, too. One is going to be KJ Wright. He was out last mm-hmm. game and we, we didn't mm-hmm. talk about that much, but it was kind of just an interesting discussion around KJ Wright. Kind of mysterious as the coach talked about him going off for some kind of uh, quote unquote process on his knee. Right. And uh, so we're going to see how it, but Carol says it's not an injury, but he's having a process done on his knee. So I I don't know what that means. And right. I don't think they want us to know what it means, but I'm going to be watching KJ right now in this game against the Chiefs. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see how he moves. I mean, part of the reason that they got gashed on big run plays there against the Vikings was uh, the lack of KJ Wright in there. Yeah. Um, you know, Garvin got smashed up. I mean, he just, he just got, taken away in the wash uh, and allowed for those big runs. So the addition of KJ will be big. I'm definitely excited to see that. Uh, apparently he did not go to Switzerland and have the platelet thing done. I'm mm. going to go. I'm going to go with bullshit. Catfish. It wasn't definitely- Switzerland. It was uh, Germany. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He had the Kobe Bryant thing done. That's what happened. It's just the way they're talking about it. I don't, I don't know why you don't just say that though. Is it- it's not approved in the U S. Oh, okay. So you got to be all mysterious about it. Right. About the process to the non-injury to KJ Wright's knee. I think they do that stuff up in Canada, too. I don't think you have to go over to Europe. Huh? No, you can't. No, there's no medicine in Canada. <laughs> they don't have they don't have medicine there. That socialized crap. That will just you, you. Everybody dies. What do you think nobody they do lives. in Europe? <laughs> everybody dies. Nobody lives. That's what happens. I, I, Statistically proven. Look it up. I know. I think I've heard yeah. this from uh, in, in political circles frequently. Yes. 
Yeah. No, or just my dad. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he tells me anyways. That's why they do witch doctor procedures over there. Uh-huh. Like God, uh, KJ Wright's knee. Maybe they did a Hakra cleansing for just for his oh. knee. Oh, yeah. Hakra he had, knee cleanse. He had That's bad, what it is. He had bad knee Hakra. Definitely. Definitely something to get fixed. So yeah. KJ Wright will be watching you, especially, you know, with Travis Kelsey in this game, too, for the Chiefs. Can the Seahawks, do we finally have a plan for how to handle tight ends? Going into the season, this will be the time to test it out. Travis Kelsey is one of your top tight ends in the NFL. Let's see. Is, are we going to use McDougal out there when when Kelsey's in the game or are, are we going to do something different? Or is Travis Kelsey going to crush us much like all the other top tight ends seem to do? Well, last year we did well against tight ends. Dude. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. Yeah, did we really did. play anybody who was I, we because we played Greg Olson again, we played Greg Olson again, Gronk. We we took him out yeah, for the rest of the season. Year. Yeah. That yeah. Was, so I guess we did play some top tight ends. Yeah. So there. OK, so maybe. Yeah. I, well, sh- I'm not I'm not even going to pay attention to it. Then the Antonio Gates thing in week one of the preseason didn't worry me at all. That's just, you know. Philip Rivers well, and Antonio Gates doing their thing. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I don't need to worry about it. Is what you're telling me. That's exactly what I'm telling you. I appreciate uh, that. One of the things that I'm looking forward to is watching uh, Patrick Mahoney's. Yeah. <laughs> to go out there and uh, throw at least three or four picks because I thought he'd be terrible coming into the league. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm interested to watch him. He just he's a chucker, dude. He's a total chucker. Yeah. Well, it yeah. could be. And we've played against chuckers before. Exactly. It, it generally saying, works out well. Second, third string, uh, you know, DBs, get ready. Here's the time to make your mark because the guy with the big Mahones is coming in. And he's going to chuck it around. <laughs> exactly. And uh, speaking of the guys that watch on the Chiefs, just how the offensive line holds up against that Chiefs defensive line. I view the defensive line for the Chiefs a lot in the same way as the Vikings. I think they're pretty comparable. They're one of the you know top groups. And how how the Seahawks handled that. Now, this is a little bit different because now they were t- looking at a 3-4 instead of a 4-3. But uh, that'll be another thing to look at with some of the young guys and, and less experienced guys on the offensive line. It seems like that can sometimes be a struggle for guys uh, not knowing their assignments when they're matched up against a, a different style of defense. Spoiler alert, Brandon. They're going to look okay, and we're going to have struggles at tackle and in, uh, in pass protection. I'm not that interested to see how that goes in some ways because, like, I, I've seen this movie before. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, yeah, we just need to let it go and just yeah. be okay with uh, the with it the is way what it is. is. It is yeah. what it is. That's it is what it is. That's going to be the uh, theme for the offensive line this year. <laughs> yes, 2017 Seahawks. It is what it, it is. is. What it is. <laughs> Every everywhere else is awesome. Uh, right. I like that. I like that. I like the spin on that better. Yeah. 2017 yeah. Seahawks. Everywhere else is awesome. Every other position group is awesome. Hey, uh, maybe, maybe that's what the Jets, uh, their their team mantra should be this year is it is what it is. Right. Just a, just a whole team. <laughs> uh, we're trying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and we're going for the first pick. All right, Adam. Well, what do you say we get into the second half of the show? Sounds good, man. Be sure and check out Seahawkers.org. It's a place to go to check out all of the chapters of the Seahawkers Booster Club and uh, see if there's a chapter in your area. Now that it's getting time, it's getting to the season. You need to make sure that uh, you have your your places lined up of where you're going to be watching the games this season. It's go time. Don't be like Tom Cable and put off these decisions. Like, lock it up now. Like, just make a decision of where you want to go as you're starting Seahawkers Boosters Club. Like, go and find it. Go and find it. And uh, yeah, lock it up, make a decision on where you're going to be watching your games. And I'm ready to watch some games this year. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm already done with preseason. I've seen enough now. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm ready for two, the regular two season. games. Seems like the right amount of preseason games, doesn't it? I agree. I agree. And they're talking about, you know, shortening the preseason, definitely at least cutting it down one. And they said maybe two. And where they're saying that earlier in the offseason, I was like, no, 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 don't cut it down to two. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was I was getting a little panicked. Now I'm like, yeah, cut it down to two. The easy the easiest thing for me to, to what the NFL should do, cut it down to two preseason games mm-hmm. add one regular season game. You can keep both your home and away games at eight. Have that one extra game, that 17th game, and you can play that anywhere. 
So you could have, you know, you could do your uh, a few games over in London. You could do a game down in Mexico City. You could do a game in Las Vegas before the NFL gets there. You could do a game in Oklahoma City or, you know, they, shoot, they're playing games in a soccer stadium down in San Diego. You could have games anywhere between two NFL teams. Yeah, I'm 100 percent against that. No, I, I mean, I, no, they, when everybody whines that they lose a home game because a team goes and plays overseas or somewhere else, shut up. <laughs> God, it is not that big of a deal. Cry me a river. And then to add an extra regular season game on there for the wear and tear on these players, if anything, I'd be for cutting a regular season game. The the players can't make it through a full season hardly anymore. I bet they do my idea before they do your idea. Well, I'm sure they do because one of them, you keep getting them checks. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're not cutting out a game. Come on now. (laughs) Well, I just, I'm not for adding anything to the regular season. That's for sure. And especially the idea that like whiny pants can't handle his team playing in London one week. Like get over yourself. If I were in Seattle and I had, I knew I could count on 10 games, you know, two preseason games, eight home games. I would, I would want to go to all of them. Correct. (laughs) I don't want to lose one. (laughs) Well, I, I get all that, but I would be Mr. Whiny pants in your scenario. I don't appreciate this. Don't be Mr. Whiny pants. Suck it up. (laughs) All right, cupcake. You're just going to have to watch one on TV. Somehow you'll be all right. Yeah, well, I, I watch plenty on TV, so that I guess I can yeah. deal with that. And that's what I'm getting at. But uh, one thing to keep in mind as we get into later in the preseason, no roster cutdowns from 90 to 75 man. You see a lot of people not realizing they changed that rule in the offseason. It's mm-hmm. going to go from 90 right down to 53. Right. But you got to carry those extra dudes for an extra week. You get to carry the dudes for an extra week. That means more bodies available to play in that fourth preseason game when your yeah. starters aren't out there. Exactly. So, and, you know, it gives those guys an opportunity as well to go out there and showcase what they can do for other teams potentially. So, I mean, the idea of cutting that fourth preseason game does suck on that level because it gives a lot of guys, fringe roster players, the opportunity to really shine and maybe make an impact and and hook up with another roster. All right, Adam. Well, uh, let's get into welcoming some new members of the flock. We got some emails this week. We got some iTunes reviews. This is this is a stacked second half of the show. Fantastic. I love welcoming in uh, more people that I can call my little flockers. You're. (laughs) Uh-huh. <laughs> Come on. Just uh-huh. Uh-huh. You even laugh. It was like yeah. for you to sit there and say that wasn't funny. You can you can shut up. I, <laughs> I could see you laughing. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether or not to laugh or groan, and I feel like the default was just to give you a courtesy laugh. That wasn't a courtesy laugh. I know I've I've seen your face on a courtesy laugh. That wasn't a courtesy laugh. You're probably right. You didn't want to laugh at it. I know that. That's that's yeah. more of what it was. But you couldn't help yourself. And I know all of you else couldn't either. You, you little flockers. Uh, we. I don't know if we need that for our new nickname for our <laughs> flock members. Oh, it's already stuck. There's no, nothing you can do no, about it. No, it's not sticking. It yeah. is not sticking. <laughs> it's already done. No. It's, a, it's like it's like al dente pasta, man. That that's sticking mm. right to the wall. That that there was no courtesy laugh on that one. No. Didn't didn't have to be. That was a bad joke. Exactly. <laughs> no, that wasn't even good for a dad joke. Uh, I know. Okay. As long as you recognize yeah. it. They can't all be winners, Brandon. All right. So welcome to the flock to Paul Westland, who came in with the top level this week, joining at the $12 level. Holy smokes. Welcome to Paul. Yes, absolutely, Paul. Also, welcome to the flock to Jake Burdeen. Uh, in at five dollars. A welcome to the flock to Jen Hartman. Jen sent along a note said started listening to the podcast recently and just signed up as a patron. Love me, my Hawks and all the fellow twelves. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, thank you, Jen. I, I love all you flockers too. Stop that. <laughs> <laughs> you can't stop it. You can only hope to contain it, no, Brandon. I can contain it. <laughs> <laughs> and a welcome to the flock to uh, Jacob Foster. Also, welcome to the flock to uh, Chad Engman, says Brandon and Adam. Thanks for the podcast. I'm a longtime listener in 49er territory and now between two rivals with L.A. south of me living on the central coast in Lompoc, California, uh, does try my patience. But your podcast, I find, is my best connection to the Hawks. 
I keep meaning to support the show, but this week's podcast with Adam bragging about his Patreon imminent win threw down the challenge. Good advertising, by the way. Challenge accepted. <laughs> I signed up at the Russell level of $3 just to take Adam on and put him in his place. Now, I just need a good handle. Keep up what is obviously the best Seahawks, if not football commentary out there on the interwebs. Go Hawks from Chad. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate it. Uh, prepare to to go down. And that's fine. Um, but uh, I'm glad that you decided to throw your hat in the ring and at least give it a shot. But uh, yeah, I mean, even with a good handle, you're screwed because I'm running the table. And thanks to Chad for getting in there and all the other people that got in at the three dollar level or higher because we do have an anonymous donor for all of our new members of the flock that donate at $3 or higher. Our, our donor is willing to match at the $3 level for all of our new members of the flock. So appreciate everyone joining this week and Absolutely. also appreciation to uh, Brian Stevens and uh, bulldozer who gave us uh, a little bit of a raise this week to help get themselves yeah. into the, uh, the patron pick em league. Yeah, with all those cool prizes. So, yeah, thank you very much to you guys. I think we're getting uh, uh, notably closer to that goal of 300 patrons, Brandon, uh, where we'll start doing the postgame shows. We're getting there. We still got some work to do, but uh, we still have a couple weeks left uh, before the season starts. We have a couple more weeks of our anonymous donor matching our new members yes. of the flock. So, uh, yeah, get them in here before September. Look, I, I'm kind of looking forward to the idea that we could get to that 300 level. And with the last couple of weeks, you guys have really stepped it up. You guys have been awesome. Absolutely. And uh, one of those people who stepped up last week, Joe in Atlanta, I missed his note last week. Oh, Joe says, I just joined the hustle like Russell Patreon flock. Nice. I've been listening for about three years now and finally got around to returning the value you have been giving me for so long. The rants are my favorite part of the episodes. Of course, the offseason allowed for our annual Tom Cable rants. But now that the season is upon us, we can, cern, we can soon turn our attention to Bevel, Richard, and individual o Lyman. I'm sure Lacey and Curse will get their due attention as well. Living as, as a Seahawks fan is not the only thing difficult about living in Georgia. So I want to thank you very much for introducing me to Jen B's Congressional Dish Pod. Oh, yeah. That's from uh, Joe and on Twitter, Dr. Joe MCK. Well, uh, Joe, I think really did identify the uh, circle of ranting like that goes on throughout the season, like the, the whatever subject catches your eye. Right. Like he, he, he understands the ebbs and flows of it. Yeah, like, I, I was very impressed. Yeah, because it's like now the we're getting into the season. It's going to yeah. be the rants are now going to be for our coordinators. Yes. And holding exactly. them accountable as we do as fans. <laughs> You know, it's coming. You know, it's coming. <laughs> and I was just out at, uh, you know, we mentioned last week that I was out in the Bay Area. I actually uh, got to chat with uh, Jen Briney of Congressional oh, Dish, yeah. got to meet up with her and her husband. Uh, that was kind of fun. And uh, talk a little bit of football. They're going to, uh, they're, they're big Marshawn Lynch fans now this year going to Raiders games. So that's where they can kind of come together as Seahawks and Patriots fans. And uh, kind of and being in the Bay Area, they can be Raiders fans together. That's kind of fun. Oh, well, yeah, I guess that is. It's kind of fun. I'm I am watching the Raiders. I don't know about you, Adam. Did you watch again? No, and I, no, they, not they, doing it. Well, no, nope. that's like going to your ex-girlfriend's Facebook page, checking out what she's been up to. Nope. OK, not I, doing it. I will say that it was being in the Bay Area really difficult to see a lot of Oakland fans like all really fired up about Marshawn Lynch. Yeah, no, you got to unfriend, block, and just never go there again. And never go there again. Otherwise, it'll bum your life out. And that's how I feel about uh, Marshawn with the Oakland Raiders. Like, I know I'm going to have to see the occasional highlight, you know, and all that. Kind of like running into that, that gal in the grocery store, you know, after about like three, four months. Yeah. And that's fine. Nothing you can do about that. It's out of your control. But yeah, no, don't tune in on purpose. Part of the reason why I tuned in was to cheer against the Rams. Because Oakland yeah. was playing the Rams and it just seemed like a natural thing. Oh, I can see what Marshawn Lynch is doing and and I can also root for him to beat the Rams. Cause you you can justify it all you want, Brandon, but at the end <laughs> of the day, it's gonna be bad for your self esteem. I'm just telling you. I understand. Well, it was <laughs> yeah. it, it was a little bit of a hit on my self esteem because I did watch Cooper Cup uh, have have a pretty solid game. Against Whatever, the, dude. I watched his six catches from that and like you know some of the biggest plays were like. Busted coverage, dude falls Deuce. down. <laughs> a couple dudes like, fell down. Yeah, I mean, 
okay, neat. I mean, they're so not maybe, Karen Williams catches. No, the, no, indeed. So maybe I don't need to be a, at all worried, but no, you don't. Well, let's get into some reviews. A couple of reviews here. One from uh, J40 in the US says, love these guys. Been listening for a couple of years now. Sorry, I'm just now getting to this. And this is hands down my favorite place to go for all my Hawks info. Especially thankful that you guys keep it up during the long off season. Give me something to consume besides the catfish, quote unquote, journalism that goes on during that time of year. Keep it up, Brandon. Don't ever change. Adam, keep doing your thing and go Hawks. Yeah, go Hawks, man. Appreciate that a ton. And it re- really, reviews like that, it makes going through the whole offseason for us worth it. It's, it's totally worth it. From JC98901. Oh, I wonder what zip code that is. I'll tell you what zip code it is. Oh, okay. It's Yakima, Washington. Oh, well, there you go. It has it right in the parentheses. Oh, I, I, well, there you go. That makes it a lot easier. Yeah. I guess I should have used the cheat code like you did. <laughs> you put it right in there. JC says, these guys are awesome. Gives feedback on Seahawks is their main focus. They also talk about other major NFL topics. Highly recommended if you're a Seahawks fan. Nah, thanks, dude. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, all the way there from Yakima. Uh, that's a cool country. I, I hadn't been through Yakima ever before, and I, I got to buzz through there, not but just a few months ago. And uh, pretty, pretty interesting area. I got lost there one time trying to go to Oregon, and uh, it totally uh-huh. threw me off. Yeah, the streets are confusing there. I will give it that. It was before I got there where the streets were confusing. <laughs> oh, well, they're before, in the middle, and after. It's just confusing all around there. And finally, from Levi from Adelaide in Australia, says the go-to podcast for any Seahawks fan, a quality podcast that will help you learn more about the game, about the Seahawks, and about your fellow 12s. I'm from Australia, far from the game, and have been listening for about 12 months now, and these guys have it all in one place. So if you're a 12 like myself, a diehard supporter, new to the flock, or getting or looking for a team to support, I promise you, this is the podcast for you. So do yourself a favor and click the subscribe button, and you'll be better at life than Skip Bayless. Oh, that's an amazing review. Yeah, there's a call to action in there and everything. I know. Look, I got to say, out of all the overseas listeners, man, um, the Aussies have been stepping up. Yeah, they've been coming through. Yeah, they've been strong. So, uh, you know, not just looking at you, Canada, England. Well, I, I do notice that I, I probably send more stickers and uh, uh, welcome to the flock packages to England and Canada. Right. So lay off on them a little bit. Oh, OK. Well, maybe. Fine. Come to their defense like you always do, Brandon. Don't call anybody out. <laughs> Don't make any waves. Don't call them flockers. Yeah. I, I don't. <laughs> I, I'm glad you're understanding my my certain set of rules that I seem to have. You know, yeah. you know me well. Yeah, I understand them. That does not mean I'm going to follow them. Yeah, you, yeah. I'm going to break them all. I know what you. I know what you don't like, and I'm just going to pick go. at it until. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get on to some email. All right. Sounds good. Because that that was like that was a, a nice little segment with uh, two guys that have known each other since like kindergarten. Like you, you could tell that right there was like yeah. an old married couple <laughs> <laughs> there for just a couple thirty seconds. Yeah, just to, you know, one of our one of those not not a fight, but no. uh, you know where you know how to pick at each other. Right. Yeah. Right. I imagine. I imagine that's what like a subtweet is all about. Not really. Am I wrong? Not yeah. really. No, yeah. I still don't understand Twitter. Then that's like talking behind somebody's back. Oh, oh, that's dirty. Yeah. Yeah. All right. First one here from Michael in Virginia Beach. No, oh, it's been a while. Michael says, great game yesterday. Williams keeps shining with spectacular play. Michael hasn't gotten the word on it. It's it's Karen. Well, you can call him just by his last name. I Williams. guess. <laughs> Making a clear statement that he wants to be on the squad come game day. When Fant went down, what are the chances that we can find a decent O-lineman to replace him now that the team will be forced to do so? I'm back home from my deployment and would like to send you both my appreciation for the podcast you've supplied me throughout the entirety of my underway. Now it's time for our Hawks to take this league over. Super Bowl bound. Let's get there, gentlemen. Look forward to the next year and all the future podcasts to come. Shout out to the 12th Man of Virginia Facebook page. Thanks, guys. Go Hawks. Shout out to Michael. I like the enthusiasm, yeah. man. Even with the starting left tackle going down, being like, nah, I'm just brushing that off. We're still going to the Super Bowl. That's what Michael says. I love it. I know. Matt Tobin. He's going to be our starting left tackle, Adam. Matt Hoobin? The, the Matt, Matt, Matt Tobin. 
Oh, right. That guy. <laughs> the dude from the Jets that we signed. He's the answer. <laughs> the Jets, huh? One of the green teams. Phillies. The, the Eagles. <laughs> Did he play for the 76ers? Uh, the Pirates. He's a pirate. He's a Pittsburgh Pirate. Totally a pirate. You nailed it. Nice. <laughs> you nailed it. Matt Tobin. Matt Tobin. New starting left tackle. That's your answer, yeah. Michael. He's a rememberable guy. <laughs> <laughs> he played for many teams. <laughs> oh, yeah. Alex in London, next up in the email. I said in my last email a few months back, I was heading over to Seattle for the first time with my girlfriend and two sons. Well, that trip has passed, and what a trip it was. I got surprised with training camp tickets. I went to day three of camp, and it was amazing. I was outside the rent and shop at 7 a.m., hoping to get on one of the first buses so I could get front row to watch the practice, and I did. It was great. I even got my 12th man jersey signed by Blair Walsh, Chris Carson, and Michael Bennett. It really made the 4,700-mile trip worth it. Washington is such a beautiful state. You guys are so lucky to have stuff like Mount Rainier on the doorstep. What a breathtaking thing that is to look at. Simply amazing. Go Hawks. Go Hawks, man. I'm glad the trip was fun because training camp really is a cool experience if you can make it out there. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, it's definitely a different vibe than game day, but uh, it's 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 cool hanging out. Just getting you, you feel that excitement from everybody before the season starts. Yeah, without question. And you get to interact with the players a little bit. I mean, Blair Walsh, Chris Carson, and Michael Bennett there. Like, that's a good trio. Those are all going to be dudes that are on the 2017 roster. Like, so that 12th man jersey's looking good now. It's looking really good. A couple, you know, when preseason started, you'd say, well, at least I got Michael Bennett's signature. But now, I, you know what? Alex has the opposite of whatever you have when you run into Seahawks players in person. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly it. He doesn't give them their bounds. No. But, uh, yeah, well, and, and good uh, good on Alex, too, to escape uh, the Pacific Northwest before Mount Rainier blew up. So uh, congratulations on getting out of there before it actually exploded. Oh, was it on fire? No, it's going to explode. I, just, I know it is. Every time I go out there, it's going to explode. There's going to be, like, all sorts of lava everywhere. There's going to be a tsunami. And it's just going to be death. That's what you're worried about, huh? Every time. Not the earthquakes yeah. you're worried about the... Well, I'm worried about the earthquakes in the sense of the tsunami. The tsunami is the scariest natural disaster in the world to me. Yeah. Yeah, they freak me out more than anything. Okay. Yeah. Do we get tsunamis on the West Coast? I don't think we do. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 they do. Oh. Uh, it, it, yeah, there's been historically some gigantic ones. I thought it was over on the, the West side of the Pacific. Well, no, they, they happen over here, too, just not very often because of the way the fault lines are. Mm. Like, they don't, they don't, you know, bust up, you know, into big earthquakes with all that much regularity. But when they do, it wipes, wipes stuff out. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. I've, I watched a whole documentary on this, I've man. I've never seen a tsunami on the West Coast. I know. I said it's rare. Like, the last one. <laughs> like, it's never happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The last one was back, like, in, uh, you know, tribal days, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah, a lot of the Native Americans around in the area like had wrote it down in lore and stuff about how like you know terrible just, it was, huh? Yeah, just uh, villages being swept out in the ocean, and then they confirmed it by corroborating tales over in Japan from the same era, the same years, describing a tsunami that hit their side of the uh, the ocean as well because it was such a huge one. It went, oh, you know, both, it went both ways. Yeah, two way tsunami. That sounds really rare. That'd be a good band name, by the way. Two way tsunami. tsunami. <laughs> yeah. So I'm open up for fish. <laughs> that wasn't even a courtesy laugh. That was actually funny, Brandon. Yeah, thanks. It's a good dad joke. I did see fish once. They're terrible. One of the worst concerts I've ever been to. Well, if you don't like jam bands, then you're not going to be in a fish. I like Blues the- Traveler. Yeah, I mean, they're sort of a jam, but like fish is like the jam like band. Like they of jam only bands. jam. Yeah. 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 If it, I mean, I know what type of music you're into. It doesn't surprise me at all you weren't into the fish concert. I wish you would have told me that before I bought tickets. Where are we at there, buddy? Uh, I didn't have your back. I know that. <laughs> didn't have my back. Yeah. One guy who I know has my back, Mike King, who I met up with when I was in the Bay Area. We nice. met up at the airport before I took off. Oh, right on. Yeah. Hauling jet fuel to the what? airport. Mike hauls that- jet fuel. Wow. I know. That's That's an explosive job. I'm sure it's not dangerous at all. You don't have to worry no. about anything. No, I'm sure it's all just, just whole just a every chill, day. back and forth, driving, driving around, driving gallons of explosive jet fuel around. Yeah, well, what don't could think, go wrong? Don't think about that part. 
Hey, Mike, uh, stay safe out there. <laughs> and watch out for two way tsunamis. <laughs> and thanks for the coffee, Mike. That was uh, it was cool hanging out with you. Nice. That was fun. This was a good trip. That sounds way cooler than my trip to Louisiana. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just based on region alone. Probably. Yeah, it was nice and cool in the Bay Area. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't like that in Louisiana. It was almost. It was just about the perfect temperature the whole time, where you kind of like you were tempted to carry around a jacket just in case, but you never needed it. See, this is this is a good moment that we're in two different towns at this point because I want to strangle you through the screen when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I sweated my nuts off out yeah. there, man. Yeah, yeah. it's brutal. And I got to watch the Giants beat the Phillies. Oh well, that's cool. In the battle of the toilet bowl of baseball teams this year. Is that what it is? I, so I hear. Oh, okay. I don't watch baseball at all, so I couldn't tell you. All right, Adam, what do you say we get on to do better and better at life? All right, Brandon. My do better this week is for uh, the news news outlet, Quartz. And, uh, I've never heard of them. Yeah, they're an online you know, publication, but they're, they're in like the random news feed on my, on my tablet, right? Yeah, based and, out of Russia, uh, probably. No, they're 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 American and I can tell you exactly how you know they're American is with this whiny crap that they wrote this week. All right, this is for might do better this week is for Quartz and Georgia Francis King. The title of said article, Brandon, is Suffering from the Post Eclipse Blues? Psychology explains why you feel sad after a big event. No, I'm not suffering from the post eclipse blues. Like I watched the eclipse, it was cool, then I went on with my life. Not, you know, not everything has to be like, oh, it's the most epic thing ever. And then everything is depressing. Like that, that's the way like social media seems to work. And uh, Georgia Francis King here writes this whole article and it starts out like this. The sun is back to shining in all its resplendent glory. The Northern hemisphere is returned to its normal operating mode. Your Facebook feed has resumed its regular baby photo programming. So why do you feel so meh? I don't feel so meh. I feel fine. I saw the eclipse. It was cool. You know, had a corn dog. Like everything was great. Everything's still great. Like, and then she goes in this whole long article about uh, how science has proven that you can have the quote post adrenaline blues and why you feel so bad after you do really cool things. Nobody feels that way except for maybe whiny millennials. This is a giant joke. Don't give it the credibility of writing it as a news story. I don't like the thing at all. It's a bunch of whiny crap. So for Georgia Francis King, Quartz, do better. Well, Adam, that leads right into my do better because my do better is for the moon. The moon, Adam, because we were in a partial eclipse zone here in Montana. Yeah. And I have to say I'm really disappointed in the moon. Really? Because the moon wasn't getting it done. I didn't want to be one of the people that were stuck in traffic having to drive eight hours just so I could be in the, the totality of the eclipse. Correct. I thought yeah. we were close enough. I thought yeah. we were close enough. Because what was it? Like uh, about 90%? About for you 90%. And you yeah. know what? The moon didn't do anything for me at 90%. It barely blocked out the sun. Like I could still, I, I set up like a little camera to, to be on the sun. It looked just about as intense as normal. I mean, it got a little bit dimmer outside. I got right. a little bit cooler outside. Yeah. But it wasn't, it wasn't that impressive. Uh, maybe yeah. I'm going to have the, the post eclipse blues because right. I just, the moon didn't do enough for me being here in Montana. And uh, for that, for the moon <laughs> next time, why don't you fly straight over rather than flying eight hours to the South? Maybe you could do that for me. Do better. How dare the moon using the gravity to like dictate its orbit and everything. Yeah. Stupid moon. Come at me moon. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Hey, look, it, it was better for you there than it was for me in uh, Louisiana. Yeah. Like, it was an 80% eclipse there. Yeah. And so I went and I bought uh, an extra pair of sunglasses and then a pair of uh, cutting torch goggles because I needed a pair anyways, <laughs> yeah. and it would fit my bag going back. So I doubled up on the sunglasses and then put the cutting torch goggles on over top of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I got the gist of it, but it certainly <laughs> wasn't as cool as big in the in the total eclipse area. No, I did hear that it was kind of cool being in the in that zone. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I don't know. If maybe the moon next would time just we'll, cooperate, you could have been. Yeah. Well, 2044, I guess, is our next opportunity for when it comes over Montana. Oh, well, that's fine. We'll be celebrating what are like 50th pot anniversary by then? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe 30th. I was told there'd be no math. Okay. <laughs> About 25 years, right? Ish. Yeah. Yeah. Give 27 years. I don't, I don't know. Don't ask me to do math on the fly. <laughs> that's why I didn't do it in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about All right. some better at life? All right, my better at life this week is for 
uh, some of the coaches of the Venezuelan uh, Little League World Series team. Venezuela was playing the Dominican Republic. They go into the ninth inning, tied up 2-2, or they were down 1-2, Venezuela was. And uh, they get a couple runners on, and uh, the pitcher for the Dominican Republic, who they were playing, was a, a kid named Edward Usita. And apparently, he'd just been punching everybody out all through the Little League World Series. It was basically unhittable. Gets a couple guys on base, and then he gives off. It gives up a walk off triple. Two runs come in, and Venezuela wins three to two. The second that the Venezuelan player touches a uh, home plate, and it's clear that uh, they have won. The pitcher, this kid, he just falls to the ground and just starts sobbing. He's just destroyed. I mean, he'd been carrying this team for you know the whole tournament, and you know who the first people out there were. Two of the Venezuelan baseball coaches, they go running out there, pick him up, give him a big hug, you know, just, you know, trying to console him, Mm -hmm. let him know that it's okay. They go through the, you know, the good game line after, right? Uh, The the kid that... uh, Hit the walk off triple, you know, gives him a big hug. Uh, the, you know, the coaches just kept talking him up and everything. And it really restored my faith in humanity a little bit, you know, just the idea that even in that uh, big moment there in the Little League World Series, when you should be celebrating your own success, you go out of the way to pick up, uh, you know, the people on the other side of the thing. Here's one of the quotes from uh, the manager, Alexander Ballesteros. He said, uh, Edward has a big heart. It was sad. Could have happened to anybody. The uh, Dominican Republican uh, manager, Jose uh, Cordero, said, we're all Latino. We're all brothers. And uh, I just thought it was a really cool gesture. And uh, that's what sportsmanship's all about. So uh, to those folks on the Venezuelan Little League Baseball World Series team, you are better at life than Skip Bayless. I like it. I always like to see sportsmanship and uh, at that level, too. With those kids yeah. and you know, seeing what, it, because at that level, that's where you see athletes who really care about yeah. playing the game. Yeah, and clearly the the pitcher did. You know, Edward Yusita. I mean, clearly he was all in. Yeah. You know, he was invested, and uh, to have your heart broken that way. I mean, yeah, you know, I'd I'd have broke down and cried at that age too. Right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So, I'm sure I cried at some at playing some baseball games in Little League. I barely won anything in my first year in third grade. Our team stunk. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was fifth grade flag football. Uh, my my Cowboys lost to the Redskins in the Super Bowl. Oh, and I definitely goodness. I definitely cried after that. It, in my football experience in grade school, seventh grade. Yeah, won one game that year. <laughs> one game. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I don't know what happened to why the other team was so terrible. But we weren't good. No, it was was bad news. Kid sports. Exactly. Yeah. My daughter's first volleyball game is going to be Saturday. Oh, good luck to her. Yeah. So that'll be fun. Well, my better at life this week, Adam, is for Anquan Bolden Mm. retiring 14 seasons, 200 games, 200, 200 plus and 14,000 yards receiving. He almost hit that 14,000 yard mark. He would have done it if he would have stayed playing this year for the bills, but decided this last week that he had some more important things to do. And here's the quote. He says, football has afforded me a platform throughout my career to have a greater impact on my humanitarian work. And at this time, I feel drawn to make the larger fight for human rights, a priority. And he said, my life's purpose is bigger than football. So he's decided after 14 seasons, it's time to move on. And, Man, if you can think of a guy who's had a more outstanding career as a wide receiver, you know, coming into the league, really had a huge year his first year. I know the one, the thing that I remember the most about Anquan yeah. Bolden is his toughness and a dude that got just yeah. that injury that he took, that he suffered in the end zone when he got busted his entire face and was back to play. That's one of those types of injuries where you don't expect guys to come back from. And he came back and now has had a Hall of Fame career. I expect Anquan Bolden to be in the Hall of Fame. Do you? I do. He could end up in the Hall of Very Good. No, he's a Hall of Famer in my mind. Well, okay. Now, as a human being, you know, if we're going to take that into consideration and stuff, too. Yes, a Hall of Famer. Really uh, class act, tough guy. 
Uh, always had a lot of respect for him in his game, in his life. Uh, pretty cool to see him take the next step. And uh, I'm not surprised at all that uh, he has a, a larger vision of what he can do with his life going forward. Yeah, I mean, I just think of all the the big games that he's played in, you know, won a Super Bowl with the Ravens back in 2012. You know, he played mm-hmm. on the 49ers team that went to the Super Bowl, played on the Cardinal. Was he on the Cardinals team that went to the Super Bowl, too? He was on a number. Mm-hmm. Of, I'm not sure if he was still on that team. I don't think he was. Yeah, he may not have still been with them, but uh, definitely the Super, you know, has a ring, which is great to see for a guy who played in the league for that amount of time. And this is kind of how I, I would envision Michael Bennett's career going out, right? Like, having a plan for what you're going to do, being passionate about it and, you know, very similar issues that they're passionate about. And, Mm -hmm. uh, Anquan Bolden deciding to hang it up and work on that full time. He's my pick this week. Better at life than Skip Bayless. Fine choice. Fine choice. Even if he was a rival for a good, good part of his career. I can put that aside now that he's retired and say Anquan Bolden for the Cardinals and for the 49ers. Fine player. Yeah, fine player, fine man. Well-deserved. All right, Brandon. I think uh got another show in the books here, and I think what's well-deserved for us is to get off the mic. This went a long time for us today. This took a, this took a long time for us to get this uh, recorded. Well, you know, when your phone's ringing throughout the whole show. I know. It was annoying, and I'm really sorry. Or when you have little <laughs> kids coming in and out of uh, the podcast studio. Which was less studio. annoying. That was less of a, that was a, less of a, a distraction, man. I suppose. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had business. I, I did kid things. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Apparently, there's parent meetings I need to go to today. This is why wow. we can't do the show live. I'm convinced. <laughs> yeah. It might not be the smartest thing. But if we do end up getting to uh, 300 uh, patrons and we do the uh, post game thing, I think we'll do that live. That's true. That'll just be a quick thing. We'll just, you know, do like 20, 30 minutes yeah. or something. I can lock the door. You can turn off your phone. It's just 30 yes. minutes. Yeah. It'll be good. But in fairness, in fairness, Brandon, how many other times has my phone interrupted the podcast? A couple times. Yeah. But less than 10. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In for five sure. years. Yeah. yeah. Why are we talking about this? Let's get out of here. All right. With that, there's only one thing left to say. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.